Booking. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kelly Buchanan, and we'd like to welcome you today to the five levels of communication uh, presentation of the Tennessee Trains program that will be done by Dave McCauley this afternoon. This is Kelly Buchanan, and I um, am a member of Tennessee HFMA. I'm currently serving as the VP of the East Region. I work at Embion and uh, live in Knoxville, so I'm happy to be uh, with you this afternoon. I wanted you all to know that you are all currently on mute. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions as we go through this process. Now, we have posted the slides on the website, and you can find the link in the GoToWebinar chat box, which is down toward the right-hand bottom of your screen at this time. I've got a few upcoming events that we'd like to tell you about in the Tennessee HFMA. The next webinar will be on August the 12th, and it will feature Mark Polson, who will provide an update on the two midnight rule and other CMS updates. You can register for that webinar now by visiting uh, TennesseeHFMA.org forward slash webinars. Please save October 22nd through the 24th for the Fall Institute of the Tennessee HFMA, as always located in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Also wanted to take just a moment to mention we've had uh, several new sponsors come on board in the last few weeks and we'd like to thank them for their support and let any of you who would like to inquire around sponsorship for your organization know that you can find details on the HFMA website. Please note uh, many of you um, are able to include this training today for your CPE certification. And a couple of things to remember, uh, you must be connected to this webinar for at least 90% of the duration. We expect it to last right around an hour today. You must also respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions that we'll have today. Now I'd like to get um, on with the introduction of our speaker today. We have Dave McCauley. He is the founder, president, and CEO of Summit Leadership Foundation, as well as a founding member and an independent certified coach, speaker, and trainer of the John Maxwell team. Dave has a broad background of leadership experience in business, nonprofit, and church settings. His passion in life is to add value to the lives and vocations of leaders in order to help them be successful and add value to the lives of those they serve. Dave and his wife Susan have been married for 35 years and have three adult sons. And I'll let him fill us in a little bit. I looked through the bio and was not sure exactly where he was located. It looks like he may be um, an East Tennessee resident. So, Dave, I'd like to hand it off to you this afternoon. Thanks so much, Kelly. Yes, I'm up in Johnson City, Tennessee, up in Northeast Tennessee. So uh, it's great to join everybody today and, and so glad to be with you. Uh, we're going to talk about the five levels of communication and, and quite frankly if, if you were to go on Google and, and put those words in and search the five levels of communication you would come up with literally dozens of charts and versions of uh, that title and, and what it represents. So let me just as we begin our session today talk about what we are going to take a look at. Uh, many of the models of five levels of communication are built around transferring content that's really not what we're, we're going to look at today. What we're going to look at is we're going to look at five levels in the process of connecting with your team members uh, in such a way that with your team you're, you're going to build trust. Um, it's not just about the communication, but it's about the connectedness uh, with you as a leader or a manager of your team of how you involve and engage those team members in the process of communication within your team and within your organization. That's what we're going to look at. So today, as you have the opportunity to send in questions, let me just say that we, we want to model this today as well. I don't want to just talk about it, uh, but we're open for your questions and also for your pushback. So if you hear some things that I say that you just don't agree with, uh, I'm just giving you a green light. Just throw that in there and send that question to Kelly and say, hey, I don't agree with that point. Here's from my perspective what I see. And I think that openness in our communication with each other and listening to each other is, uh, is just valuable. And when we look at everybody that's on this call today, our collective knowledge and insight and perspective is very, very valuable. And, and we want you to uh, be involved in this conversation and not just have me just present uh, information. 
in, in my experience with working with varieties of organizations, everything from schools, and we do everything from, uh, you know, school teachers and principals up to uh, higher education and colleges, uh, to nonprofits, uh, to churches, and to businesses uh, around the around the region and even around the country, we find it's common to have communication challenges. I, I, have you all experienced that? You just it, it, communication is just tough, and things that we say that you know we we meant it one way and somebody else took it another way. I don't know about your organization, but drama uh, within the team uh, where people are. Uh, excited about things either outside the workplace or something that happens inside the workplace that becomes a distraction. Uh, communication where someone's complaining to someone else that can't do anything about it. Uh, Dave Ramsey refers to that as his definition of gossip is when you say something to somebody and they can't do anything about it. That, that's not productive at all and in fact in his organization it's a uh, means for immediate dismissal. So we want to talk about how do we bring that connectedness together within the team. And we're going to look at a framework that can help you improve your communication with your organization as well, not just within, but outside too, with key stakeholders, with your vendors, with customers or clients. Uh, and communication is really a key connecting point. And if we see, and this is the challenge for today, if we can see communication as a connecting point, between you and your team members and not just the transference of information, we can go a long way in being able to build an environment and a culture of trust. And, and team members who understand these five levels uh, are gonna be much more effective in getting their team to work well uh, together. So, so some of the things we want you to be able to do at the end of this session as we do the polling questions and as as you're looking at what you can take away from this today is for you to really understand these five levels of communication that we are discussing in this today that, that help you connect with your team. And, and then be able to explain the value uh, in, in finding time to listen. Oh my goodness, communication, that's, that's probably the biggest challenge of communication is not so much the talking part as it is the listening part. And as leaders and as managers, finding the time, and I know for myself, the discipline of taking time to listen and not to charge ahead. And I, I even think back as a parent, the amount of times that I've got onto my kids about something and, and didn't listen to why they did it and, and later feel a certain amount of regret. And as a parent now of grown children, they don't mind telling me those stories of when I jumped to conclusions and maybe uh, didn't listen uh, to what their reason was or their explanation. Uh, we, we also want to learn how to explain uh, or how to use team members' opinions to gain their buy-in. Uh, th this is huge. Uh, it is so scary and so risky to open up for people's opinions, but it is absolutely essential. And we're gonna see this as we go through the presentation today, that listening to the opinions of our team members is the doorway or the, the opening that we're going to create to get to deeper levels of communication with them that are going to build trust within the team and actually help the whole team I believe to be stronger and, and, to, and, and to become better. So here, here's your takeaways for today that we hope. Uh, good communication will not just happen on its own. It just won't. Uh, you're a leader, you're a manager. E even if you are not in a leadership position on your team, you can have influence from anywhere within that team by just being intentional. So leaders have to be intentional, whether you're a positional leader or whether you're just going to be a leader of influence on a team about taking their team to deeper levels of communication. And the reason you wanna to go to deeper levels of communication is because it's going to build trust and it's gonna enhance performance. By doing these things, uh, you'll be able to, to take your team to greater levels of trust and higher levels of performance. So let's get started and start looking at these levels of communication. And again, jump in anytime if you wanna send uh, questions to Kelly or if you disagree with a point or if you wanna raise a different point. Uh, and have me comment on that, feel free, and she'll she'll interrupt me and, and help us with any of those questions. We're just going to be informal with this conversation as we go. Here's, here's the first level of communication, and this one is really, really common. Cliché. <laughs> I bet y'all can think of some cliché conversations you have. In fact, I already had one uh, getting online. Uh, one of the other folks online said, how are you today? And I said, fine. My goodness, that's one of the most common cliches. We do it all the time. You go through the drive-through at McDonald's or Burger King or 
or wherever it may be, or uh, just at the grocery store, and someone says, how are you doing today? And you say, fine. It becomes one of those conversations that we just easily have. Uh, it's more common than you think, probably even in your team in your office. In fact, if you want to take the challenge of having your team members identify cliches that you're doing within your team, uh, it's, it's, that's kind of a fun little exercise to do if you have that level of trust and communication with your team. But a cliche is simply any overused or standard reply or comment that usually just fills silence but really doesn't contribute to the conversation. It's important as a leader to understand that, that if a listener perceives, perceives your comment to be a cliche, then it's a cliche. And this is so, we may be stating something that we think is important fact. We may be stating something that may be our mission statement, maybe even a value of the company or the organization that we work with. It, it may be true. We may be telling people that you have to get here on time or else. Well, if, if they hear that as a cliche answer, it's not engaging them in the process. It's just filling space. It becomes overused and standardized, and it's not building trust within your team. So any overused comments, whether they're factual or not, can become simply a cliche on your team. So I want you to think about this with company mottos, mission statements, you may even be having, they may even hang on the wall, core values even, those things that we say that define us as an organization or as a company can become cliche once they lose meaning or relevance uh, to team members. And if we're not discussing them or engaging them in those conversations, then uh, those phrases become empty. So any comment designed to end a dialogue abruptly or, or settle an issue is a cliche. Think about that. It, when you as a leader just make a comment that, you know, that e even if you just say a phrase like, this is the end of this discussion, this is over, or we're not going to talk about this anymore, uh, that in some way ends up being a cliche. It, it fills time, it abruptly ends, and it's not, it hasn't done anything uh, to engage that person. But, he, but here's, let me just go through some examples of cliches that you may have uh, thought about, and you can write down some of your own, you know, uh, that's not how we do it around here. Trust me, that will never work. We need you to give 110%. Think about that. What does that mean? How can you give 110%? Uh, you know, I, th I think if you got everybody given 100%, 100% of the time, that would be pretty good. Even things like the customer is always right. You know, really, are they? Uh, you know, what, what are we really trying to say by phrases like that? Uh, one that you may have used with your kids if you're a parent, but we do at times use it in the workplace because I said so. Just do it because I said so. Or here's one, and I know we've got some financial people on here, and I always get in trouble with this one. I'm going to go ahead and throw it out here. And remember, you can push back. You can send a question to Kelly or a comment. But sometimes the phrase, it's not in the budget, can be perceived by our team members and even our key stakeholders. Is cliche. Remember, if they don't have a way to engage that, or if it shuts down communication, or if it's just a phrase to fill time or to end the conversation, then it's simply a cliche. It hasn't taken our team to a new level of trust. So I know that it's not in the budget, can sometimes be backed by fact, and it may be a true statement, but is it heard by the listener uh, as a cliche, as an empty phrase that they can't then do anything about or engage any further? So that's basically the overview of with cliche. And, and cliches are at the shallowest level of communication. Let me just say, the reason we end up in cliches is because we're in a hurry to go to the next thing. Cliche is always about what's next, not about what you're talking about now. And that's one of the dangers of it within a team and one of the reasons that I think we need to identify it and, and to uh, understand that we can get caught in the cliche trap. Let's take a look at the second level of communication, which is reporting facts. In, let's agree, facts are important. They really are. And uh, they're a huge part of your business day. Just think about your day today, uh, the amount of data uh, that you will have to review, or uh, it, it could be a contract that you have to take a look at, or it could be hours of performance, or certain KPIs that are on your list of things to accomplish today within your company or within your team. Those are important. Those facts, those data, the, the data, the, the information that you're managing uh, are, is important. So we're not saying it's not important, but we, we want to talk again about these levels of communication is how do we now take facts and use them to connect 
team members and not to distance team members. Because let's face it, most business decisions, and most of your decisions that you will make today are gonna to be based on facts. Uh, so they do matter, but they don't naturally connect us. In other words, when we report facts, we have gone into an objective mode that is not necessarily interpersonal it doesn't take into account maybe the context of where the other person is coming from or the context of their world at that time. We can too often get facts presented in a what I would consider two-dimensional. They're just on a sheet of paper and we're handing them to someone and we don't understand that life is three-dimensional, not just two-dimensional. So when we present those facts, those facts are entering into that other person's context. And, and we don't, as leaders and as team leaders, we need to understand, and this is part of what we're going to be talking about today, is that unless we understand that extra dimension that those facts are entering into, uh, those facts can end up distancing relationships within our team rather than connecting uh, team members together. And, and think about facts. Total strangers can report facts. Competitors or even enemies can report facts to each other. So there's nothing naturally connecting about facts. And then sometimes facts are used to help us win. Uh, it, it ends up being a win-loss instead of a win-win, which is actually another cliche. But it helps us to win arguments instead of, or a disagreement or to prove someone else wrong. So sometimes facts will actually create distance between us and the other person uh, that we're communicating with. Uh, but facts can also be used to unite. Now, I want you to think about this just for a moment because it, this is so true. And with your team, I think this is a positive way to use facts or to use data. Uh, think about a sports team, and, and maybe some of you all played sports or you've been in some competitive situation to where the coach calls a timeout and, and, and gathers you up in a huddle. And, and, and the facts are that there's only 10 minutes left to play and we're 10 points down. And we've got to play harder and more focused. If, if we're going to compete and if we're going to win in this game. It's all based on facts, and those facts are used to motivate or to guide a team forward. So facts can be used to help you connect the team if you use those facts in the right way. So, so facts in and of themselves are not bad, and, and they can be used to do good things with your team, but also remember that if facts are used like a big stick, uh, to beat someone over the head or to confront them or to win or to prove them wrong, that that creates distance and that's using facts in a bad way as far as trying to connect your team and to build relationships. Anytime that facts are reported where it creates a barrier to relationship instead of building the team, facts are being used incorrectly. So. Think about this, and this is just as a summary of this whole topic of facts, is facts can pre be presented either to build or destroy trust. Keep that in mind. They can be used to build or destroy trust on your team. All right, let's go to the third level. This, this is my favorite level, and this is the one that is probably the scary level as a leader. But this is the level of opinions. And, and how often do we take time to ask the opinions of those that we lead. Uh, one of the books by John Maxwell is The Five Levels of Leadership, and the first level is position. The second level that he describes in the level of leadership is that of permission. And I find that one very interesting, but John Maxwell says that if you don't have the permission of the people you lead, if you don't have their permission for you to lead them, you're not taking them very far. Once you get their buy-in, once you get their permission, once they believe that you want their best and they get to be part of the solution, then, then you're gaining their buy-in as a team. And one of the ways to gain their buy-in, to gain their permission, to gain their support is to simply ask their opinions. And just as we began this call today and we recognize that on this call with, the, with all the people that we have engaged in this call today, the collective wisdom and knowledge and insight and perspective it's huge. It can really help us. And I want you just to imagine for a minute a beach ball. If you had a beach ball sitting on the center of a table and, and eight or ten people sitting around the table, that beach ball has multiple colors. It has orange and white and blue and red and green. All those colors on those different panels around that beach ball, and each person sitting at the table sees something different. So you may look at me and say, Dave, what do you see? And I said, well, I see orange, white, and yellow. And across the 
table, Kelly's sitting there and she sees blue, green, and red. Is Kelly wrong? No, she just has a different perspective. She has a different opinion from her perspective of what that beach ball looks like. And her opinion becomes valuable to me as a leader in understanding what's going on. So here, here's what, and we're gonna get right, right into our, our first polling question just in a second here. But this is what I wanna, I wanna say about the value of opinions is when we are trying to solve a problem that comes to us, too often we take the approach as leaders that we're just gonna fix it with the facts. When so often the discussion gets broken down, in other words, we haven't dealt with a difficult situation by creating discussion or dialogue, we've ended up approaching it by something that needs to be fixed instead of seeing it as an opportunity to engage our team. So Kelly, let's go with the first uh, polling question. Okay, at this point, everyone should be able to take the polling question, and I'll be able to sh show the results shortly. We've got about 10 seconds left to vote. All right, Dave, that shows you the results of the team of the group. Yeah, Kelly, I'm not seeing them on my screen, so what I, I may have something set up wrong here. What's what's the uh, what kind of results did we get on that? Okay, it looks like they're pretty evenly split with 29% saying usually proactive, 32% okay. 30, saying usually reactive. We have 14% who avoid the issue and 25% say it depends on the issue. All right, great. Oh my goodness, that's uh, what a uh, great feedback on, on, that, uh, on that particular question. The question is really about approaching these difficult issues and and are we willing to engage the opinions of others on our team? And those, and, and let me just encourage you on this, that if you can figure out ways to get proactive, and that's what we're gonna be talking about in the rest of this session, is how we can become proactive. And, and here's one of the issues that I really want to raise, and we're, we're gonna be talking about this again in a minute, but if we don't spend time ahead of time dealing with some of these issues, we will, spend a lot of time on the back end of the problem and of the drama and of the fallout if we don't take a proactive approach. When we're reactive or when we avoid the issues, they only tend to get worse. They can tend to get more complicated, not less complicated as time goes on, but even worse, they become in, ingrained in our culture uh, that we're going to avoid or not deal with these things. And sooner or later, when you have to rally the troops, uh, you're not going to be able to get them to get on board with it. So I want to go uh, to our next, our fourth level and, and talk about feelings uh, really quickly here. Okay, feelings. This is an emotional part of things. And, and oh my goodness, this is, this is difficult to, to get to within a work environment because how people feel about things, we often think that they ought to be leaving that you know, outside the office that work is to be done. But we are do, we're dealing with human beings. Uh, they're not just human doings, uh, they're human beings. I mean, they be, they, they feel, they are going to get frustrated. They come to work with a context. Why don't you think about your own day today as you came to work today? You know, we, we, maybe we're not feeling the best, maybe we had some sort of argument with a family member, maybe we're dealing with a difficult situation within our family. Uh, 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 someone who is ill or someone who is, has passed recently and we're still grieving, whatever those things may be, those, those affect our being and, and who we are. And in the work environment, if there's some way to understand, and, and that's all I'm talking about here is the understanding part of this, that where we understand the context of the feelings, because as we deliver facts 
as people share their opinions, below, just below that at a deeper level of connectedness and a deeper level of communication is when we're dealing with their feelings. Those, th those emotions that are bubbling up through the way they react and even at times the choice of words that they use. Have you ever done this before where in, in fact there, is a, there are studies done on this when we get angry or frustrated? I don't know if you've ever had this experience or not. I know I have. In fact, I remember one time I had a, one of my sons went to the University of Memphis and we were moving in, him in his, his apartment down there and, and we had gone to, to Sam's Club and, and I, we'd gotten gas and we were trying to get some stuff fixed on his truck and we were buying some stuff in there. And next thing I know, they, the, the credit card company put a hold on my credit card. Have you ever had that happen when you're out of town? Well, I had that happen to me and in, in the middle of all the rush and that 95 degree heat down in Memphis, if you've ever been there, the heat and humidity is just, uh, can be a lot, especially uh, in, in, the, in the late summer. And, and we're trying to move him in and all this stuff's going on. And I, so I call up to reinstate my card and the question they asked me, well, what, what is your balance on your last statement? And oh my goodness, I'm, I'm trying to explain to them, I'm out of town, I don't know. And, and, and I got this level of frustration and, emo and, and emotion that started bubbling up in me. And there's actually studies on this that call this reptilian brain. I don't know if y'all have ever heard this before or not, but in, in, at times it's even referred to as lizard brain. And you can Google this. It's kind of a fun little thing to look at. But it's when we get so frustrated or when we get so angry or when we get so overwhelmed with the situation that blood actually flows away from the reasoning parts of our brain and goes to the fight or flight mode. So it goes to our extremities. And, and now in this moment, we are briefly insane, if you will. And, and the things I said to those people at the credit card company were probably not appropriate. And then, in fact, my son sat there and listened and at the end said, you think you could have handled that any better? And, and to which my answer was, yeah, probably if I had been thinking clearer, but my level of frustration and, and adrenaline started surging so much. And this can happen with your employees they, they can, and, and your team members. They can get so overwhelmed in the moment that their choice of words or what seems perfectly reasonable to them at that moment bubbles out through emotions and not through logical thinking and even logical behavior. And as leaders, we at times need to recognize that and be able to help them filter it and calm them down so that they can reason more effectively. Let me just ask you this because you may have had this experience before too. Have you ever asked someone or has someone ever asked you, what's wrong? Where, where they can see this weight on you, they can see this uh, dilemma in your situation and they ask you the very simple question or you ask someone else, what's wrong? And they answer nothing. Have you, have you ever had that happen? I, I, I've had it happen before. I've had it happen with my wife where she's having a difficult day and I can tell and I just say, what's wrong? And, and she says nothing. Well, what I've come to believe is the cause of that is that she's feeling so many different things that it's hard to identify just one that she can explain to me because it's all about the feelings. It's the turmoil of multiple things going on at that moment that is giving her that moment of crisis or feeling overwhelmed. So simply to answer nothing is to say, I can't identify what it is. And there are times on your team where your team members are going through a context in their own life, in their workload, in their family life, or how they're feeling physically or emotionally that day that it's going to affect their feelings. And as a leader, if we don't take the time to tap in or to understand at some level what that is, we're going to be dealing with them uh, in a context that we're not aware of. So here's the next polling question I want to ask about, and it's this idea of the reduction in effectiveness uh, when you have poor communication within, within your organization. This is when drama breaks out. This, this is when somebody's feelings is overwhelming the office. And, and, and what effect does that have on the team when feelings and emotions bubble out in their communication with the rest of the team. Okay, so Kelly, if you want to kind of roll on that next polling question, I'm really interested to hear what people have to say about this one.
Okay, Dave. Sure. We're closing, we're closing it now. And looks like the results with this poll uh, were down very much toward the bottom of the options here. So uh, the top score at 47% was that people said it had a moderate effect, 10 to 30% reduction. Okay. Uh, with a close following was a significant effect with a greater than 30%. 42% of respondents said that, and only 10% of people said it had a minimal effect, and nobody answered that it had no effect. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's pretty uh, common to what we're experiencing within uh, most of the companies and organizations that we work with on this very issue. And that greater than 30% is actually, we're finding that more and more common among leadership teams, uh, particularly, and I want you to think about this uh, for a moment. If you have 10 people on your team, 10, 10 people that, 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 you're, that you're paying and you start losing 30%, Let's just say you lose 30% approximately or 25%. You start losing that effectiveness on your team. You are eliminating literally two or three team players on that team uh, just by the lack of effectiveness during uh, a time of crisis or time of drama. When we ask companies, how often do you have drama events? We get a variety of answers from them on that front too. And in some it's daily. Uh, depending on the dynamics of their team and uh, of the work environment, especially when people are in a tight or closed space working together, which is probably a lot of you all uh, have that, where you don't have the luxury of, of uh, being able to close the door to your office, uh, that that becomes a, a dynamic that, that takes away from the effectiveness within, within that office. So here's what we're trying to promote through this uh, webinar today, and, and, and we're going to talk, get to the next slide here about fears, dreams, and beliefs. But hey, here's, Dave, yes. Dave, I could interrupt you here. We've had yes. a couple of, we've had a couple of questions. Come okay, let me, let me do those before we move forward then. Okay, um, so we've got a question, and I, I'm kind of struggling. My screen, for some reason, is really small to try to read these questions, but it's saying, uh, what about the peer comparison reports as far as facts? Does the competitive nature of those here we go. Uh, not demotivate at some level. Yeah, it depends on how they're, again, it depends on how those are used. Um, you know, peer evaluation, peer feedback, peer data posting, um, 360 reviews, all of these things can be used well and be used in a, and it, it, it depends on the trust, of the, the trust in the culture of the organization using them. They can be motivational or they can actually uh, hurt uh, the motivation. Of a, and I'm going to come back and let me comment on that again and remind me, Kelly, uh, when we get into the, the dynamics of how to use opinions to open up opportunities uh, to get to, to use these things, facts in a, in a more positive way, because we're actually going to talk a little bit about that uh, before, right before we end the uh, the webinar today, so I do want to come back to that, but that's a brilliant question and observation uh, that, that some of these things that we do that we think are going to be motivational can actually backfire and actually discourage team members if, if they're not used properly. Okay, we also, uh, speaking of opinions, had another question. Any comment on separating the opinions from the feelings in order to make informed decisions and yet support individuals uh, in their specific context? Oh yeah, that's a great question, great clarifying question here. And again, we, we may comment, I may comment on this a little bit more later too, but it's a, a, a great question. The, here, here's, there are some people that are going to uh, just vie for attention. So when you open up for feelings and opinions, you've got to manage this. And, and we have a whole another lesson that we do called managing the bell. And if you think about a bell curve, uh, and, and this is almost always true. Uh, you can actually name the players on your team. Let's say that you have 10 people on your team. Uh, there's going to be about two of those people, two or three of those people that are always going to be seeking attention. They're always going to be negative. They're always going to have drama. There's going to be two or three people on your team uh, that are always going to be positive. They're always upbeat. They're always, in, you know, the, whatever changes, whatever's going on, they always have a happy face. And then you got a whole group in the middle that are going to be tugged one way or the other. Well, the reality is that the positive people kind of think everybody's positive. But those two or three negative people, or those two or three people that are the drama folks, or those two or three people that, that tend to be against 
change or, or drag their heels on it are going to try to recruit from the middle. So you got to be real careful what forums that you give opinions in. Um, so that, that, that's why I love that question. We're going to comment a little bit on that uh, again later. But but some of this, depending on the trust in the players and the dynamics of your team, uh, you would do in an open team fashion. But you also want to make sure that you don't create what we call an expectation gap with your folks too, where you let them express their opinions. I mean, because they express their opinions, they think you're going to do something about it. Well, you may or may not have the budget, the personnel, or the priority, or even the desire uh, to do what they're suggesting. So we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but both those questions, that's why I love these questions, because uh, they're coming from people with a perspective and a context that helps bring some clarity maybe to, to some of these things that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, but good catches, and I think we're going to, hopefully by the end, we'll have addressed those in, in how we come back and use opinions to engage those things. So hopefully that answers those questions. Uh, I want to move on just as a sake of time here and, and, and not rush, but also get through this. But I want to talk about the next or the deeper level of uh, communication, and that's the fears, dreams, and beliefs. Now, I know we have some HR people on here, and, and I, I know this is becoming more and more difficult uh, thing to deal with within company context and company policy. And it has to be managed with a great deal of wisdom on this and sensitivity to where people are coming from. In, in my personal uh, kind of platform that, that I work from is I try to look at the uh, uh, making sure that everybody respects everybody. I mean, if we truly respect each other on a team, we can really talk about our fears, dreams, and beliefs and have a deeper understanding of what drives someone because these are the things that drive people. I have a good friend of mine up here in Northeast Tennessee that owns a barbecue restaurant called The Firehouse. And he, he manages, has about 80 employees, a lot of college students, a lot of young 20, 30 something folks, a lot of career building people that come through there. And, and he's been in business now for over 30 years and, and has people all over the country that own their own companies or their attorneys or their senators or their whatever that worked at his restaurant at one time. And he takes great pride in that. So when people are coming through his restaurant, he's talking with them about their fears, dreams, and beliefs. And the culture, if you ever get a chance to be up in Johnson City and go to the Firehouse restaurant, just enjoy the culture of their, their serving staff or their managers, because they all talk openly about where they want to be five years from now and how the Firehouse is going to help them get there. And they do budget planning meetings. They do leadership development meetings. They do personal coaching, life coaching for their employees. Uh, the servers in the company. They, they don't have to advertise when they're trying to hire because people want to be a part of that kind of culture. Uh, I've known employees there that have had a two-year exit plan where they've come to the owner of the company and said, hey, I, I don't want to do this anymore and I, I want to go do something different and, and I want to start my own company or I want to start my own restaurant. And with his blessings, they come up with a one or two-year plan to transition them out. And, and that's just opening ourselves up to what are the dreams? Of the, where are our staff going? They didn't sign up for life when they came to work for our company. They may want to do something else later on. And, and do we know what that is? And do they know how what they're doing today may contribute to that? Uh, people's beliefs uh, drive them. Uh, this can be their internal values. This can be what they believe about your company or what they believe about work. Uh, what they believe in this could be even in the spiritual or personal realm. But those are all going to affect uh, performance and what motivates them. And that's as leaders understanding and respecting that among the people that we work with is huge. But here's one of the ones that trips us up is the fears. If we don't understand the fears, and, and I, I'm working with a company here where they've got some long-term employees. The company is just built. It's been, it's been growing like crazy in the last few years, but they're getting ready to celebrate 50 years in business. Well, they've got some of their employees have been there almost that whole time. They started right out of high school, and they're at that stage now where they're going to be retiring soon. And this company is moving at such a fast growth pace. They're on a 20 to 25% growth per year. Uh, pace here the last couple of years and for the foreseeable years. Those employees are fearful of what's going to happen to them and to their job and the company of how they knew it. And, and, and you know, the, all they can do is, is to be sensitive to that and to have open conversations and to understand that this is a fearful time and change is a fearful time for someone that is wanting to retire or someone that sees a company not doing well and they think, are they going to cut back? I'm going to lose my job. I mean, that becomes an element of fear. So we, if we understand the fears, dreams, and beliefs of our people, it'll help us. Let me move on here to how we 
put this into action because I don't want to lose this and, and I get excited about this topic and I'll probably talk too much. But this whole opinions thing is about really getting with our staff and making the time on the front end so that we save time on the back end. If, if you're going to lose 20, 30 percent or more of your effectiveness as a team, doesn't it make sense to, to proactively set aside time that you're going to engage your team and try to head off uh, some of those effects that will happen on the back end if you don't get their opinion and their input and their buy-in on the front end. So here, here's one of the, uh, the next, uh, Kelly, we're going to go to the next polling question uh, about team meetings. Okay, Dave, uh, we have the results in on this, and it looks like uh, almost even split here at least once per week with 39% of respondents, one to two times a month with 37% of respondents, 15% uh, said occasionally as needed, and 5% said once, at least once each day, 3% said never. Okay. All right. Well, those are actually pretty good. Uh, the ones that are doing it uh, once a day, I'd like to actually hear if you can uh, send in to Kelly how you're doing that. If you're doing like stand up huddle or you're having a sit down meeting, I'd like to get a little bit of feedback about how you do those meetings because to me, that's one of the things I think is having those touch points every day. Uh, and I do know that there's lots of different methods to do that where it's not overly time consuming. So if you could send some of those ideas into Kelly so we can share them with the group um, of how that might happen if you're going to have more frequent meetings. Again, we're trying to be proactive so we can save time on the back end, engage our team, and also get their buy-in to the things that we're doing. Let's talk a little bit about when you get team's opinions, what happens? Well, the worst thing you can do when you get a team member's opinion is to answer with a cliche. When they give you really what they're, and, and just tell them, hey, you, you know what, that's just the way it is around here. Or, you know what, you get paid to do a job, go do your job. If we answer the cliche with a cliche, we've lost an opportunity. The same thing happens when we answer with facts. We, we can come to someone and they can express an opinion about, you know, I don't know why we can't do this. And maybe the fact is it's not in the budget. And again, we'll come back to that one. I know it's a landmine for me to use that as an example, but we're going to tell them it's not in the budget. Well, what they may be telling us, remember the beach ball analogy? They may be seeing something. They may be seeing an opportunity or a threat to our organization or to our product or services that we haven't noticed that may be money well spent if we went after it. And if we, if we just report the facts, it's not in the budget or we don't have time to do that or we don't have space to do that and, and, and we don't listen to that opinion, uh, or, or we just tell them that, you know what, management made this decision and we're just going to have to learn to live with it. Uh, any of those kind of answers shuts down that opinion. What we want to share with you and just in the closing minutes that we have together, and this is kind of the application portion of this, is what happens when people share their opinions. If we as leaders can learn how to take them from that opinion that they shared to deeper level of communication and understanding of who they are, as a human being, then we can gain trust and we can gain their buy-in. When we just answer with facts or cliches, we miss the opportunity to take them deeper in, in our understanding of who they are as a person and how, they can, how we can tap into how they can best perform on our team. So I want to go to the next polling question uh, about the engagement of your team. When you Do they participate in your team meetings? Do you have vibrant team meetings.
Okay, Dave, it looks like the results of this survey show that 43% uh, a fairly large majority here say some are engaged and some are not. Followed at 25% saying most are engaged. 18% saying all are actively engaged. 14% said they typically listen but don't speak. And nobody said that they don't think we need team meetings. Okay, those are good. We got some good teams on here. I want to, I'd actually like to hear from some of those teams that are having those where everybody's engaged and because that's kind of where we want to go with this. And let me just talk about this pivot point of getting opinions. When people share feelings, we can do that within the within a team meeting and typically it's going to be safe and typically people are going to play themselves out as to, uh, you know, what their personality style is and but getting everybody engaged. And for those of you that have team members who don't engage in a meeting, uh, sometimes it's, it's a personality style. And, and we need to be careful with this. If you're old enough, and this is going to date me, you remember the old E.F. Hutton commercials back in the late 70s and 80s, uh, where E.F. Hutton was known to just be sitting quietly in the corner of the room. And, and the tagline was, when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. And, and it was because he was a very thoughtful person. And, and process things thoughtfully. If you have me in a meeting, I'm, I process verbally. I'm going to be talking and I'm going to be engaged uh, just because I like to share ideas and I think out loud. And it, it, at times I'll end up arguing against myself in a meeting because I just talk in a circle because I, by talking about it, I, I, I process it. But I've got some good thinker friends. That a lot of them are engineers and they tend to be quieter and they tend to be more analytical and they tend to have to have a little bit more data uh, to make the decision. They're more concerned about being accurate in what they say than just saying words. And you have some of those people on your team. And, and it's not that they don't want to engage, it's just that they, aren't, they don't process information the same way as everybody else. So helping them ahead of time by things like having a preset agenda of what is going to be covered in that meeting, uh, of how they could prepare for the meeting, of in the meeting asking them if it's okay if, if if you can ask them to share what they're thinking, even if it's not a finished thought at that point, is a way to engage them. But you want to make sure that you're getting everybody's thought. It's a thought tank uh, that's going to help your organization and bring uh, the most out of each team member. It's also going to reveal to the other team members the dynamics of that team. Another great lesson that we teach at Summit to leaders is, is called the incomplete leader. And we really talk about how important it is for a leader or a manager to view themselves as being incomplete, that they don't have to know everything, they don't have to see everything. If they can see themselves as incomplete, then they have a greater value for completing themselves with their team and with those other people with varying strengths and different perspectives than what they have. So when we ask people's opinions, we have this, from this slide that we're on right now, we have four choices of which way we're going to go with that. Up to a cliche answer, we just shut it down or solve it. We can answer it with the facts, but that's not, that may solve the problem or resolve the issue, but it's not going to connect them at a deeper level. Uh, we can use the facts, however, to motivate them. We can say, hey, if we, we really need to hit these numbers. Here's the numbers. We need everybody pulling together to hit these. But when someone expresses a feeling in a meeting, this is what I, I want to, uh, one tool that you could take with you on this is we call it the discipline of who and why. You know, who does this affect and, and why has it affected them that way? Just ask those questions, the what, where, when, and how you can worry about later. But if you can drill down with the why question and, and, and who they're worried about or who they're concerned about, what you'll find is when someone shares their feelings, it's because of some other relationship. There's a other who, it's their family or it's conflict with someone else on the team. And, and why. There, there, there's depth to the why. When, when they express a feeling that they're frustrated or that they're overwhelmed, why? Is it because they don't have enough time or is it because they're too distracted or what is it? Or because they're fearing losing their job or because they're never going to fulfill their dream or because the way you're doing business violates one of their beliefs or their values. And if you can drill down with the why, and, and, and we actually do an exercise with leaders to ask five why questions in a row. You can drill down with five why questions. Why do you, what you feel? Well, because I'm frustrated. Well, why are you frustrated? Well, because I don't have enough time to get this done. Well, why don't you have enough time to get it done? Because I keep getting interrupted. Well, why do you keep getting interrupted? Well, because we're in an open work environment. Well, why do you think that that 
you know, you know, why, why is that a problem for you? Is it, do we need to move you to a different space or is there some other way we need to accommodate this or whatever it might be? And, and, and sometimes you can get down to understanding what are their fears, their dreams, their beliefs, what, what's frustrating them or what's causing the problem in the situation. So let's go to our, our uh, question number, let's see, which one are we on now? The number five, Kelly, the polling question. Yes, this is the fifth and last polling question. All right, let's do this last uh, question, and then I want to just close us with some comments because our, our time is wrapping up, and then any final questions that you all might have. Okay, Dave, um, so the reports we've got in say that half of respondents, 50%, say they have open, vigorous, respectful debate to resolve issues. 28% say a supervisor determines who is right. 22% say we avoid it as long as we can. And the bad news for professional facilitators is that zero respondents said they hire an outsider. <laughs> All right, let me just comment on this as we're wrapping up and closing up. Uh, to the ones that have vigorous, respectful debate to resolve the issue, 50%, was that the number on that, Kelly? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, hey, kudos to that. That is actually one of the healthiest ways to engage your team and to build trust. It's an opportunity for doing it, as long as it's respectful. Uh, let everybody get things on the table. Now, I know there are super, uh, supervisors that come in and listen to both sides and then have to make a call. It's like an umpire. In a game, I mean that ball is low and in, in uh, on the outside, and somebody has to call it for the game to go on. And there are times where it is appropriate for a supervisor to come in and make the call. But let me, um, and, and this isn't a commercial for outside facilitators, but let me just say that something that I've noticed when you, if you ever end up with an impasse or a really difficult situation, or a, or, or someone that's a difficult employee to deal with, bringing in an outside facilitator, uh, someone who has experience, it could be a counselor. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a little tip here. Sometimes you can find a good realtor that can do this because they do it for a living. I mean, they're bringing people with opposing sides to, to a common goal of, of purchasing and, and selling a house together. They have facilitation skills of listening to both sides and finding common ground. But the biggest thing you gain by having an outside facilitator come in to help is you raise the energy for appropriateness. When we're around people that we feel very, very comfortable with, when we're around a environment that we feel very, very comfortable with, we don't tend to put the same energy into being appropriate. This is why if we did studies in marriage and family, most fights and conflict happen within your own home. It's because you were, you're more relaxed there. You don't have the same level of energy that you do when you're out in public or when you're in a work environment to where a supervisor or a boss or a customer. Think about your energy level in front of a customer or a client compared to in front of those people that you work with day in and day out. You, you gain energy in front of people that you don't want to look bad in front of if you, if, if you want to take it that simply. And by bringing a facilitator, an outside facilitator into a room with a group when you're going through a very, very difficult or tense situation, will raise everybody's energy for appropriateness and you'll have a more productive uh, conversation around those uh, particular uh, issues and, and, and things that, that may come up. Uh, I want to leave you all just with any contact information. We're here in Johnson City, our website address. And, and let me just say that if you're on the call today and, and that if, if I can help you with anything at all, my, my direct email is dave at summitlife.org. It's just our website with my name, Dave, on the front. And uh, we'll be happy to you know, answer any questions. And Kelly, I, I am sensitive to the time here, but did we have any follow-up questions that I need to address before we wrap up our call?
Not a question, but we did have just one quick remark uh, that I think everyone will find interesting related to getting the active participation. And yeah. uh, this this person says that on their team they incorporated a round robin style forum, and that has helped them become much more productive than when they were in the original meeting style. Yeah, that's uh, brilliant. That's uh, and and if and if that's the ground rule, everybody knows it coming in. They know what the rule. They know how it's going to go out, and and they're prepared for that. So that's that's good. But that's all we had, Dave. We we certainly appreciate your time this afternoon. I, we did have 68 uh, participants in this right. session today, and uh, we so appreciate you all dialing in, and hope that you will take the opportunity to sign up for another Tennessee Trains webinar in the future. Thank you all.